it's my very great pleasure to introduce Dr. Annette Kim. Um, Dr. Kim received her undergraduate and her MD PhD at Harvard University and Harvard Medical School. She <clears throat> did a couple of years of a postdoctoral fellow at um, Memorial Sloan Kettering and worked at Merck Research Laboratories before going on to complete her clinical pathology and hematopathology training at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Uh, she practiced hemepath and molecular diagnostics and was the associate director for molecular diagnostics for several years at Vanderbilt before moving to Brigham and Women's Hospital in 2015, where she continues to practice hemepath and molecular. She's an associate professor at Harvard Medical School and an affiliated faculty with the Broad Institute. Um, at Brigham and Women's, she's the associate director of the Center of Advanced Molecular Diagnostics and with it within that entity as the director of the Heme Molecular Laboratory and the Translational Biomarker Corps. And at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, she's the medical director of the BH3 Profiling Flow Cytometry Lab and co-director of the Interpretive Genomics Program. Uh, I just found out though that she will be moving to Michigan to head up their, uh, their merger of their couple molecular and cytogenetics labs. So she'll be doing that this summer. Um, she is very active in professional organizations, and that's actually where I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Dr. Kim is at when we were both at the CAP, but she's also served as a member of expert panels and guideline advisory groups within ASCO and has been a member, vice chair, and chair of many working groups and committees within a lot of national organizations. She's also an excellent teacher. She's been recognized for her teaching, winning the CP Teaching Award twice at Brigham and the Resident Teaching Award twice during her time at Vanderbilt. And she also actively teaches the pathology community, having given uh, just under 30 lectures at national and international courses and conferences, in addition to giving numerous invited lectures and providing online educational material and podcasts. In addition, Dr. Kim's an active researcher. She's been involved in 29 grants, five of which are currently active, and she's been the PI in over half of these. She holds several patents and has over 130 peer review publications, reviews, and book chapters, including publications on her topic for today, which is clonal hematopoiesis. And since she has such a clever name, I'm going to pass it over to her and let her give that <laughs> to the rest of you. And I really hope you enjoy her talk. Thank you so much, Sophia. It was um, it's a really pleasure to to be able to speak with all of you this morning, and I want to thank all of you for uh, braving the freezing cold. I guess that you're having, as well as the early times time and the holiday season, uh, to listen to me talk about I cuss, you cuss, we all see cuss at Boston Drivers. Um, there is some method to the madness, so I hope that that will come through in uh, the talk. Um, I do have a couple of disclosures, just that I uh, was a consultant for LabCorp and I get some research funding from the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. And there's one slide on some of the um, work that I've done with MMRF. Um, so these, uh, this is the testing menu for the Center of Advanced Molecular Diagnostics. Um, there's sort of three separate laboratory spaces, one that is mostly anatomic pathology testing, one that is mostly clinical pathology testing, which is almost all heme, and then finally the translational biomarker core. And I actually direct both the CP and the translational biomarker core laboratories. And you can see our test menus here. The assay that I'm going to talk to you about today the most is called the rapid heme panel, which is our smaller heme-directed um, uh, panel, although I will just briefly mention Anka panel, which is our larger pan cancer panel. Um, this is the total number of RHP cases per year. It was initiated in 2014. Um, you could see that there was some steady increase. Then there was some restrictions put on on the frequency of NGS testing by um, our both CMS and some uh, our Blue Cross Blue Shield insurers. And so there was a little bit of a um, tapering off of, of the NGS testing. And then it started to go up again. We had a new version of RHP. And as I'll show you, uh, since then, our volume has pretty much just skyrocketed with the new version, even despite a small COVID dip. Um, Here's the comparison of Anka panel and rapid heme. You can see Anka panel is, uh, you know, an order of magnitude larger than rapid heme in terms of the space, uh, genomic space that it covers. Uh, both are DNA based, so there's no RNA component for either one of these. Um, 
Oncopanel is better uh, validated for FFPE, although it does work on, on the rapid heme panel. And although Oncopanel does um, target sort of 60 intronic um, regions of, for translocations, or, or sorry, the intronic regions of 60 genes for um, translocations, you can see that rapid heme has a number of very sort of specific um, um, uh, analyses that are performed. One for FLT3 ITDs, one for copy neutral LOH specifically for JAK2 and P53, one for KMT2A partial tandem duplications or MLL PTDs. And then finally, um, we have uh, unique molecular identifiers for um, the identification of uh, hopefully MR, you know, measurable residual disease and chimerism approximations. Um, we also included in here, not just um, myeloid genes, but also things related to germline predisposition syndromes, as well as some leukemic lymphoid neoplasms. And this is just a summary of the chemistry here. Um, it is an NEB next uh, chemistry. So it is hybrid capture, although there is an amplification step as well. This is just the genes that are covered. As I mentioned, this covers both sort of myeloid and lymph leukemic lymphoid things. And so the black the genes in black are more specifically just myeloid, the ones in red are more specifically lymphoid, and then in blue we have ones that could be either myeloid or lymphoid. Um, we have again some specific germline genes that are covered because uh, variants in those can masquerade as MDS, and then we have additional baits specifically for uh, uh, CNV detection, um, identity testing, and copy neutral LOH. I mentioned that we use unique molecular identifiers in our assay. Um, if this is our old amplicon based assay shown here, and what you can see is, uh, for those of you not used to looking at BAM files in IGV, um, the 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 amp the primers are shown here with the rainbow strips, and then the reads are actually these gray bars, um, and they have directionality point with the little arrow tips. And everywhere where there's a little flash of color, it's a place of non-alignment with the reference sequence, which is shown as this little rainbow down here on the bottom. This happens to be FLT3 exons 14 and 15. Um, and so you can see that we had, um, at that time, we had 250 base pair amplicons that uh, with 150 base pair paired end reads. And so that's why that looks, you know, sort of with these overlapping areas. So again, there's all these flashes of colors in here. This is sort of the typical background noise that we used to have on our amplicon panel. And the problem, there are a couple of problems with amplicon panels in general. Um, one is that there can be uh, what's called PCR bias. So if one area, you know, if one uh, area amplifies better than another, you might have, um, you know, uh, reads that cover a given variant that, you know, are more coming from one set of primers than the other, and that can lead to some bias. So you can see here, there are three um, areas, but one of them looks, you know, the orange here looks like it has many more reads than the blue. These are actually um, unique molecular identifiers that are put on original molecules so that you can see that the parent, uh, the, the sorry, the progeny amplicons are not um, uniform across all of the different unique molecular identifiers. They literally are strings of ATCs and Gs that are attached to each unique molecule of DNA from the individual. So the, this helps solve for amplicon bias. The other thing that it helps solve for, uh, resolve is noise. So noise that is spurious and just shows up due to sequencing noise or PCR noise um, may be random and light, whereas a true variant will be across everything that has the same unique molecular identifier, allowing you to um, have very accurate variant allele fractions, as well as to get rid of all the noise. And so what you can see on the top is our new um, version of the rapid heme panel and the old one on the bottom. And there is a variant right here that is very clearly detected this flash of green here in the in the new panel that would never have been able to be picked up on the old panel. So very powerful. We can now go down sub 1% at many loci. Another thing that we added um, to this new panel was a new ITD caller. Now, uh, internal tandem duplications in FLT3, of course, very prognostically important in AML, um, would just be really easy to detect if reads were super, super long, but that's not always the case. There are two classes of ITDs, one where it is a sequence that is just purely duplicated and another where there's a little bit of non-templated insert. It could be anywhere from like one to 10 nucleotides of non-templated insert. Now, if you have a super long read that goes into the 
you know, the first part of the sequence across the mutant junction, the repeated sequence, and then back to the reference sequence, there's no issue whatsoever in detecting this by NGS because it'll recognize the two areas of reference sequence and figure out that there's something inserted in the middle. However, what happens when a read just barely clips that mutant junction? Then the very tip of that read looks like it no longer is the correct reference sequence. Um, and how do you then use that to figure out what the ITD is? And so what um, my colleague Harrison Sai came up with is that, you know, an ITD is not just a normal insertion. It is actually a duplication. And so let's think of, let's actually use what we know about a duplication to help us estimate uh, in silico, to create in silico a reference ITD based upon what we think it might be from just those little flashes of color at the end of a read. And we can generate an in silico um, ITD reference sequence and then align all the reads to that. So one of the big problems we have with ITDs is by NGS is that they're often underestimated because a lot of the reads just get thrown out in the trash. And this is a way to take all of those and sort of see what would align and become candidate reads in support of an ITD. So this is just an example using our old um, rapid heme, but this is a case that has two clear ITDs. You see two flashes of, of these rainbow sequences at the ends of reads. And we'll just take this first one as an example. If you start to look at the actual sequence um, denoted by this little rainbow, it's shown here in purple. And you can see this got G A G A T C A T A T T. And then if you look, you can say, oh, here it is, G A G A T C A T A T T. Therefore, you can infer that this must be a 45 base pair uh, duplication with a three base pair non templated insert here, this G A C. And so then we can align all the reads to that. So based upon where your primers are located and where your ITD is located, you can then say, well, then here's what it would look like with the ITD in place. And here's where now my primers would sit or my baits would sit. Um, and you can then do some mathematical calculations to figure out for every possible location of ITD relative to where your baits or primers are, you can come up with a mathematical formula of exactly how to calculate then the correct variant allele fraction or allylic ratio. And so during um, our validation studies, we had 100% concordance with the size of the ITD picked up uh, by capillary electrophoresis and by NGS. And we had a R squared of 0.96 in terms of um, the allylic fraction or allylic ratio. Um, so very high concordance with the gold standard capillary electrophoresis assay. So we put this into practice and then we found um, over the, the last, uh, let's say two and a half years, um, we found 510 patients um, who, where the clinicians were still sending out their um, ITDs to Mayo while we were while they were also getting ITD results from RHP. Um, it, it should be noted that RHP cutoff is 1% allylic ratio, whereas ours can go lower than point uh, lower than 1%. And so our um, RHP and NGS assay is a little bit more sensitive. Accordingly, this these were our results down here. And this can be summarized. Um, so RHP results were either positive or negative. Uh, the Mayo results have a suspicious category as well. And if you just assume that suspicious probably is actually positive, we had a sensitivity of 100% and a specificity of 93.4% and a concordance of 95%. So what about the 25 here that were picked up by RHP and not by Mayo? And possibly uh, as well as those 13 suspicious cases at Mayo? We think that these probably really are positive um, for an ITD and that we're you know, referencing a faulty gold standard that has a higher limit of detection than our own. So I think with these lower limits of detection, we're able to pick up um, some of these very trace ITDs that Mayo is not. I also mentioned that we have some additional baits that um, look for copy neutral LOH at JAK2 and P53. Um, and so this is just showing in um, here is a, uh, the JAK2 locus on chromosome 9P. And you can see that we have sort of um, our uh, the equivalent uh, on our SNP analysis of a BB line and an AB line. This is what things would normally look like on a true SNP analysis. Um, and when you have copy neutral L LOH, you have exchange of the material from one uh, parental allele to the other. And then you get splaying a part of your AB line into either BB or AA. And that's what you see over here in this nice case of copy neutral LOH of JAK2.
Um, we also have uh, published um, some of our analysis on KMT2A partial tandem duplications, but this is sort of what our copy number plot looks like here. Um, we've designed the copy number plot so that you can literally box out this region and expand it, and you can hover over any of these dots and say, okay, this is a, a partial tandem duplication of exons 9 through 8, and it gives you the log 2 ratio for all of those. And then finally, we uh, export export all of our data into our own uh, Dana Farber instance of CBioPortal, and so we can readily look up the incidences of any given um, gene uh, mutated in our patient population, the age of the patients, how, what their commutation patterns are, et cetera. So it's very um, friendly for doing research. Um, and so one of the studies that I just wanted to point out was that um, we, for instance, have a very even mix of peripheral blood and bone marrow on our on, um, as well as some tissue samples on our RHP assay. And so what we wanted to know is, is there a difference between peripheral blood and bone marrow between the variants called? And so we took, this is an older study now, we took a 38 month time period uh, in which we found 164 patients with paired peripheral blood and bone marrow samples within 14 days of each other with no intervening therapy. So we think that they're testing the same sort of disease state of the patient. 46 patients had no pathogenic variant mutations in either peripheral blood or bone marrow. 84 had completely concordant variants between peripheral blood and bone marrow. And finally, 34 patients had discordant pathogenic variants. Some were concordant, but some a subset were discordant. The distribution of all the disease types is shown down here. So we do have a high preponderance of AML patients, but we do have a lot of chronic myeloid neoplasms that are represented as well. So if we take a deeper dive in those 34 patients that had discordant um, uh, variants, you can see that we had a large number of concordant variants in those samples, but here are the 51 discordant variants. Um, most of those were in myeloid neoplasms and then a few in MPAL or lymphoid neoplasms. Um, if you just take those um, 51 into account, um, taking bone marrow as the gold standard, you have a concordance of almost 99%, but uh, only an 88% sensitivity, sensitivity of peripheral blood for bone marrow variants. We manually reviewed all of, uh, all of these 51 variants and actually were able to identify, um, that should say 42 um, SNVs that uh, had either sort of lower VAF or coverage that um, weren't pulled in by the pipeline, but were actually present. And we believe that these would now be pulled in and identified by our newer pipeline with the UMIs. Um, and so that gives you a concordance of almost 100% with a sensitivity of, of uh, 98%. So what were the nine uh, variants that were discordant? We were particularly interested in the ones that were found in bone marrow, but not found in peripheral blood. And there were five of those. Four of those were either NPM1 or P53. Four out of the five cases were AML or ALL cases, and they were all MRD cases. And almost you know, none of them had any circulating blasts explaining why peripheral blood might be a little less sensitive, but included in there were cases that didn't even have increased bone marrow blasts. And so we believe that this represents sort of, that bone marrow has a greater sensitivity for MRD testing, even without increased blasts, and that NPM and P53 might be more likely to be st stuck in the stem cells in the, that might just be in the, found in the bone marrow and not circulating in the peripheral blood um, if they're um, just um, in an MRD setting where they're just in the stem cells. There were actually four variants that were found in the peripheral blood only um, that were a little perplexing. Three out of the four were in the RAS pathway. And so we asked the question, is there some mutations that are preferentially found in more mature blood elements? Um, and so for that, we did a bunch of methylcellulose colony forming assays to see whether there were things in the RAS pathway that showed up that uh, would um, not have colony forming ability. So uh, be present in more mature cells, but not in less mature cells. And that actually proved not to be the case. So, you know, we think that there's just a, some variability in the testing that such that we did pick up some stuff in the peripheral blood that was not found in the bone marrow, but it is not due to their lack of sort of uh, colony forming ability or stemness. So with that in mind, so keeping in mind that we're not going to be talking about patient samples that are a mix of peripheral blood and bone marrow, um, Let's talk a little bit about some of our overall findings. So first of all, it stuff happens to all of us as we age. Uh, unfortunately, we're all getting decrepit with age, and uh, that is the same thing is true of all of our cells in our body. 
We're acquiring like as many as maybe 20 mutations acquired in each year of life, only a fraction of which are in the exons. So here is shown whole exome sequencing. And so you can see the increase with age, this is cord blood going all the way up into the seventies, um, but we're acquiring 20 mutations per year. So a lot of it's in non-coding regions. And so at any given time, a hematopoietic stem cell might have X number of passenger mutations. Now, when those mutations are found in the hematopoietic stem cell, um, leading to uh, their detection in blood samples, in individuals with absolutely no evidence of any hematologic malignancy or CBC abnormality, this is called clonal hematopoiesis. And specifically clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential is defined as a 2% variant allele fraction in again, healthy ind otherwise healthy individuals. And so here's the incidence of what is termed CHIP going up with age. Um, and you can see that um, the, the increase here is highly parallel to the in increase in all cancers over uh, per age. This x-axis starts at zero here, whereas it starts at 20 here. Um, and in particular, of the cancers, you can pick out MDS, for instance, and the heme malignancies as having that similar sort of rise or exponential growth um, with age. It also turns out that the chip variants are, um, are found in genes that are also commonly mutated in MDS. And so I refer to these as the usual suspects, which for those trainees who have not seen this movie, you should go see this movie this weekend. That's your homework. Um, so the most common chip variant is DNMT3A. Um, by far, you can see the little hash mark here. Um, but there are some other very common variants as well, including ASXL1 and TET2. Um, and these collectively are often referred to as the DTA genes. They're all epigenetic in origin, and so I've colored them gold here. And really all these mean are just, I'm an old stem cell. However, they are also found here commonly mutated in MDS within the top five. Here's TET2, asx one and DNMT3A along the, um, down here on the x-axis. The other two genes that I want to pull out here are SF3B1 and SRSF2. These tend to occur more in individuals over the age of 70 or so, and they also make the top five in MDS. And so because of that, I've, um, they're both in the splicing pathway. So I've colored them blue. And these to me just mean I'm a really old stem cell. So we have gold, I'm an old stem cell and blue, I'm a really old stem cell. And these are recurrent variants found in clonal hematopoiesis, but also end up being founding driver events in um, myeloid neoplasms in general. Um, again, these, uh, these are typical drivers in myeloid neoplasms. They, other other um, chip variants can also include p53 as well as copy number variations. These can wax and wane or, and are typically single variant low VAF and may provide some amount of st uh, competitive stem cell advantage. And so, um, just taken here from our um, uh, JMD paper, uh, you can see that we have all of these are. Um, designed by pathway and color coded. And so what we're talking about are the epigenetic and splicing genes up here on top. I don't have time to go through in detail what they all do, uh, but keep in mind that I'm color coding them by pathway. So it turns out that chip is not, chips are not very good for your heart. Uh, so chip can be found in all cellular compartments and is associated with coronary heart disease and ischemic stroke. Um, it is also, it's found, you know, as a higher risk factor than even age and type two diabetes in ischemic stroke and more so than like BMI and age in um, cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease. Um, it's also associated with other things with inflammatory backgrounds. So um, fatty liver, COPD, all of these things can be associated with clonal hematopoiesis. So it has some all, all cause morbidity, morbidity and mortality, but it is also associated with um, a higher risk of hematologic malignancies to the tune of about half to 1% per year. And as I mentioned, it can have, it has some sort of a clonal survival advantage. And so if you take those clones from a donor and you stick them in an extremely hostile environment of the recipient bone marrow, that's just had like a myeloablative, um, you know, assault to the marrow, those donor clones will actually expand out to the tune of about two to three fold in the recipient. This um, is associated with some uh, particular clinical um, manifestations. One is the uh, uh, graft versus host disease. So clonal hematopoiesis can uh, be associated with worse graft versus host disease. And then of course it raises the horrible specter of donor cell um, leukemia. However, 
there is perhaps some uh, advantage to having donor chip in terms of graft versus leukemia. Um, and so you can see here an overall survival and progress, uh, progression-free survival that DNMT3A and TEC2 actually have lower hazard risks of death or relapse. I mentioned that um, it can be found in all stem cell compartments. And so there actually is a very interesting association of clonal hematopoiesis with lymphomas. In particular, some T cell lymphomas, the, the sort of the poster child is angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphoma. And this is just a, a nice picture here of a patient that had a very high incidence of sort of these I'm an old stem cell mutations in TET2 and ASXL1 and gets a row A and becomes an angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphoma and gets in one subclone and gets an NPM1 mutation in a separate subclone and gets an AML. And so there are several papers that talk about the co-occurrence of AML or MDS with um, angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphomas, but it's also been found in other types of T-cell lymphomas as well, just peripheral T-cell, NOS, um, LGL, et cetera. So CHIP is, again, um, commonly mutated in a bunch of different T-cell lymphomas. The same is actually not true of B-cell lymphomas. We looked at patients with lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma and the only reason we looked at this sort of rather rare disease is because it's actually very common at the Dana-Farber. Um, that is a sort of a, a center of excellence for LPL care. And there, for a long time, there was just one clinician who very regularly ordered lots of RHPs on his patients. And so we had serial RHPs on these guys. And we were able to look at those that had serial RHPs um, with treatment in between and look and see whether or not the clonal hematopoiesis um, was in the B-cell clone or not. And so CHIP variants, we found CHIP variants in about 25% of all patients. They were found at a low level, independent of the LPL burden, also found before any chemotherapy. So they're not therapy derived um, CHIP variants. And so it just shows that they seem to be in a separate compartment in the B-cell realm, but in the same compartment in the T-cell realm potentially. Um, this is also borne out in a, a study I did with the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. Uh, we were doing um, CF DNA testing on myeloma patients. Um, and we the vast majority of the uh, variants that we identified were sort of non-pathogenic variants or uh, VUSs. But we did have a large number of clonal hematopoiesis variants shown here in gray, um, some p53 variants which could either be in the myeloma or the clonal hematopoiesis so we couldn't tell so they're separate in, in here in blue and then finally um, uh, some non-clonal hematopoiesis non p53 variants which are presumably the myeloma variants um, you can see that the p53 um, the the myeloma variants and the MDS variants uh, tended to occur in older individuals um, when we took a deep dive now at the sort of the myeloma associated variants, they had sort of a fairly representative distribution of RAS pathway mutations, um, epigenetic pathway mutations such as KMT2C, and then um, DNA damage repair ATM variants um, that you would expect in myeloma. However, when we looked in the clonal hematopoiesis variants, again, it showed a very typical pattern with more than half of them being DNMT3A um, with ASXL1 and TET2 and SR. SF3B1, splice, you know, epigenetic and splicing genes, but also a very high proportion of PPM1D variants. And when I'm going to take you through a couple of other um, studies that tell you where I'm getting these numbers, but I'll tell you right now that um, VAFs greater than 8.7% are at high risk of a future myeloid neoplasm. VAFs over 20% are very high risk for a concurrent myeloid neoplasm. Two or more myeloid mutations are also high risk for future myeloid neoplasm. Specifically, PPM1D and P53 mutations carry a very high risk of therapy-related myeloid neoplasms. And then finally, non, or sorry, R882 variants, specifically hotspot variants in DNMT3A are also higher risk. And you can see the large percentage of these myeloma patients that were at very high risk for having myeloid neoplasms, in particular therapy-related myeloid neoplasms. So let's talk about therapy-related myeloid neoplasms and clonal hematopoiesis. So cancer survivors in one, and our study had about a fourfold risk of clonal hematopoiesis. In some other studies, it's more like five to tenfold. Um, and those individuals are at a higher risk of having a therapy-related myeloid neoplasm, um, in particular, if they have mutations in PPM1D, which I just mentioned on the previous slide. And so this is a study now out of MS. This is a study on the 
left out of um, Dana-Farber and then on the right out of MSKCC. And you can see that PPMOD is a not uncommon age-related variant, but that it is enriched now in therapy-related um, myeloid neoplasms and that it is, in it is enriched in conjunction with P53 and CHECK2 variants, all of which are in the DNA damage repair genes. And so again, therapy tends to enrich for, ther um, for DNA damage repair pathway gene mutations. What's kind of interesting out of came that came out of that um, MSK study was that you know um, it really depends on what kind of therapy you've had. So probably not surprisingly, you might XRT is going to have a higher risk of a therapy related myeloneoplasm than say immunotherapy. I think that makes a lot of sense. But I'm not sure up front. I would have guessed that topo topo one carried a high sorry topo two carried a higher risk than topo one inhibitors, or that carboplatin would carry a higher risk than oxaloplatin. So um, some very interesting findings. It may have to do with scheduling of the you know and drug exposures with those. Um, so. We talked a lot about clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential where you have clonality, but no dysplasia, no cytopenia. There are patients that have no evidence of clonality or dysplasia, but do have cytopenias uh, of unknown causes. And so that's called idiopathic cytopenia of uncertain significance or ICUS. And then finally, you can have a combination of these two where you now have clonality and cytopenia but some weenie hematopathologist couldn't call dysplasia. And I'm allowed to say that because I'm a weenie hematopathologist also. And I know that we often put out these bone marrow reports where we say, you know, that there's insufficient dysplasia to call MDS. However, if you exclude 50 billion other things, this may possibly be an evolving MDS. And I'm sure um, Sophia and all the other hematopathologists in the audience also um, use these type of disclaimers all the time in their reports. And so again, you know, the difference between CCUS and MDS is just one weenie hematopathologist. Now I've listed out here, low risk, high risk um, for both CCUS and MDS. And so let's talk a little bit about um, the level of risk with clonal hematopoiesis of, clonal, sorry, clonal cytopenia of uncertain significance or CCUS. So here's a tale of two cytopenias. We have two mature females, both with his histories of chemo radiation for cancer, and both now presenting with pancytopenia. This woman here has no pathogenic variants detected on her peripheral blood RHP. And this woman had two I'm an old stem cell DNMT3A TET2 mutations, as well as a bad boy P53. And given the high VAF of the, the P53, which is associated with genomic instability, we also have copy number changes. So what does this mean? You know, how do clinicians use this peripheral blood data that we, we've been talking about in stratifying their patients and their risk? So we took um, all patients presenting with um, to the benign hematology clinic for any complaint of cytopenia over a 30 month period. And when we winnowed out those that um, didn't have any NGS or had known histories of uh, hematologic malignancies, we were finally left with a final cohort of 276 patients, of whom 72% had a path, uh, no pathogenic mutation identified, and then 28% that did have a pathogenic variant identified. If we then, when all was said and done in the workup of these 72% of patients with no pathogenic mutation, only 1% of patients were diagnosed with a myeloid neoplasm. When all was said and done in the workup of these, and then 46 were unexplained. When all was said and done in the workup of the 28% that did have a pathogenic mutation, a whopping 25% were actually diagnosed with a myeloid neoplasm. And again, there were some unexplained cases there as well. So this is where the 20% VAF comes in to play, into play. Um, we found that using a VAF cutoff of 20% uh, had 90% sensitivity and 94% specificity for a concurrent myeloid neoplasm uh, for a 96% negative predictive value. Now, not all of these patients went on to a bone marrow biopsy because this was a retrospective study. And in many cases, for instance, uh, especially with patients with isolated thrombocytopenia, they may not have done a bone marrow. And so, you know, we when we winnowed this down to just looking at the patients that had an actual bone marrow biopsy done, you can see that again, this was borne out that a much higher percentage of patients with a pathogenic mutation ended up with a diagnosis of a myeloid neoplasm than those that did not have a pathogenic mutation. And the negative predictive value here was 95%. We were asked by reviewers, 
well, you guys have this 95 gene panel, you know, many places have much smaller, more compact myeloid panels. Do you really need 95 genes to have this negative, you know, negative predictive value of 95%? And the answer is no. With just a 20 gene panel alone, you can have that same 95% negative predictive value. And with just a five gene panel, you can have an almost 90% negative predictive value. And if you look at those five genes, those are my five usual suspects, epigenetic and splicing genes. Um, and so in my opinion, unless the patient has some very high risk feature, like they've had prior chemotherapy or they have a family history of um, uh, AML or MDS predisposition, you know, these patients don't need a bone marrow biopsy, right? They, they have a very high chance of not having a myeloid neoplasm and they don't need to have a costly and invasive bone marrow biopsy procedure. We also followed anyone who wasn't already diagnosed with some sort of a hematolymphoid neoplasm out for two years. And again, the risk of a future myeloid neoplasm was extremely low in those patients with no um, pathogenic mutation and higher in those that did have a mutation. This study um, is very similar or related to um, the Malkavati paper that also came out covering the same idea of uh, clonal, hematic, clonal cytopenia of uncertain significance. Um, uh, this, um, this CCUS paper used a much more refined patient population. They had already excluded all other causes, whereas in our case, we had patients that you know were later to find found to have myeloma or had renal failure or had drug reactions and things like that. So ours was a completely un um, um, unbiased uh, population of cytopenic patients, and these this the Malkavati paper was a highly refined population where they had already excluded all other causes of cytopenias, and so they found three important things. One, how much of the mutation mattered, um, sorry, how many mutations mattered, two or more genes carried higher risk uh, with a positive predictive value of a future myeloid neoplasm of 88%. Similar to us, how much of the mutation mattered. Um, in their case, the threshold was much lower at 8.7% for a positive predictive value of 86. And then finally, which mutation mattered. And I know this is all very small font, so please just take note that this is meant to show you that there's a lot of blue and gold genes represented here or splicing and epigenetic genes, as well as JAK and RUNX1 and other things like PPM1D, all associated with high risk of um, a myeloid neoplasm. So either any of these three features can, um, can confer a high risk pattern to clonal cytopenia of uncertain significance, and those patients with a high risk pattern had the exact same overall survival as those patients with MDS with no excess blast. And so in my opinion, so low risk MDS had the same overall survival as high risk CCUS. So in my opinion, these really are just the same thing. And someday when I rule the world, I'm gonna actually make the WHO and the ICC one, come together and give us a single classification and two, just say that high risk CCUS is MDS. This is an example of uh, a, a case of CCUS. This was a 73-year-old male who was incidentally found to have an abnormal CBC. Um, he was leukopenic and thrombocytopenic with a little bit of a macrocytosis, but there's a confounding history in that he was an alcoholic. And so you know, much of that macrocytosis and maybe even the thrombocytopenia and things like that could be due to you know, sequestration you know, in the liver and spleen, et cetera. Um, so, uh, he had otherwise normal um, chemistries, SPEPs, et cetera. Um, a bone marrow biopsy was performed and was normal cellular with maturing trilin hematopoiesis, no dysplasia, normal karyotype. Um, uh, but his RHP showed high VAF, RUNX1, and SF3B1 mutations. So this makes it for diagnosis of high risk CCUS on all of the fronts. So the individual genes themselves, the number of mutations, and the VAF of those mutations. So sure enough, three years later, this guy starts to have a loop. So now he's anemic with a more profound macrocytosis and more profound thrombocytopenia. He now has a leukocytosis, which is mostly monos. And you can see how mononuclear his marrow is. Here's the CD34 stain showing a little bit of increased blast. And now, of course, he's got um, very prominent ring sideroblasts. And so he was diagnosed with a CMML1 with ring sideroblasts. And if you look at the supplemental materials of the Malkavati paper, 
that says that a high-risk CCUS three years out from diagnosis of the high-risk CCUS has about a 70% chance of going on to a myeloid neoplasm. And unfortunately, this gentleman met those odds. Um, his RHP showed um, sort of, you know, a increased variant allele fraction of the SF3B1 and a new ASXL1 variant, which was probably there at low VAF um, in the original diagnosis, but this particular homopolymer region on our old RHP um, had a lot of trouble with noise at this homopolymer region. Our new RHP is actually gorgeous and we don't have any problems with noise um, because of the UMIs, but um, homopolymer regions in general uh, are much harder to sequence. So this idea of CHIP and CCUS and MDS being sort of on a spectrum, you know, makes it very hard to distinguish the I'm an old stem cell of MDS from the I'm also an old stem cell that just happens to be normal aging. Um, and so, you know, up until very recently this year, literally this year, there the diagnostic criteria for MDS, despite some of the category names changing and things like that, the diagnostic criteria had really changed minimally across literal, uh, across decades. It was a little bit of dysplasia and a little bit of that. Um, but now finally in both the WHO um, and the ICC classifications, there are actual specific mutations brought out and named, um, uh, one for SF3B1 and for P53. Um, so this is the WHO classification scheme, and here it is in the ICC, again, SF3B1 and P53 being brought out as specific mutations that would um, allow you to make, uh, that actually define a category of MDS. That said, about 90% of patients will have, um, um, of MDS patients will have a mutation using a myeloid-directed panel, and there are like 47 different genes that are statistically significantly recurrently mutated, and only two of them make it into the diagnostic category of MDS, the SF3B1 and the P53. So what about the other 45 genes that are recurrently mutated? They don't make it into the diagnostic criteria. So how do, you know, how can we use that information? Um, it turns out the median number of mutations that, um, is about three mutations per sample, and the more mutations you have, the worse you do. This is just shown here, the frequency in which um, when you read the literature, when um, you see that, uh, for instance, SF3B1 can be cited as being found in anywhere from like seven to like 33% of MDS cases, depending on which paper you read. But you can very clearly see that there's a high predominance of splicing and epigenetic genes in MDS. Now, I mentioned that only 90% that 90 of patients will have a mutation. What about the 10% of patients without uh, mutation? And um, this is a paper that was done with the sort of bone marrow consortium group. Um, and what we found was that MDS with no mutations detected tended to be younger, as you might imagine. They don't have those, I'm an old stem cell mutations. And they were, because they were healthier and younger, they were more likely to go to stem cell transplantation and had better overall survival and leukemia-free survival. So I had this argument with my colleague, Rob, a surgeon over at MGH, who is also on this paper with me. He, he said, Annette, you published saying that, you know, patients don't need a bone marrow biopsy if there are no mutations, but you're gonna miss 10% of MDS cases by not doing a bone marrow biopsy potentially, you know, if, because 10% of MDSs will not have a mutation. You're, you're like, you're gonna miss all those cases. And so I said, well, let's do some math. Um, so, the number of cytopenic, the incidence of cytopenic um, mature adults over the age of 65 is 17,000 over 100,000. The incidence of MDS is 75 over 100,000 in that same population. And so the, the population that is M, um, MDS mutation negative would be 7.5 out of 100,000. If we were to screen all cytopenic patients, you know, we would miss 7.5 out of 17,000 or 0.4%. In other words, there's a 99.6% specificity of NGS screening for cytopenic patients, which is actually a pretty darn good screening assay, I think. So, you know, because of the, the just simple math, the pretest probability of a mutation negative MDS is so low in the cytopenic patient that MDS, you know, NGS screening for cytopenias is actually a very viable way. And the number of the number of patients you're going to miss is very low. Plus, you know, this is an overestimation because any patient with, for instance, history of chemotherapy or family history of MDS-AML, you know, is still going to get a bone marrow biopsy. So 
In other words, in MDS, we have, you know, at the time that a stem cell goes bad, it may be carrying any number of passenger mutations, and then it gets these splicing and epigenetic clonal hematopoiesis um, variants that then expand out. And when they hit a certain sort of critical volume of mutation um, or, or mutational burden, um, they can those patients can manifest now as myelodysplastic syndrome, and they can have any number of subclonal events. So except for those two variants, uh, SF3B1 and P53, we don't actually use them to make a diagnostic category of MDS, but we can still use the mutations to support us in the diagnosis of MDS. So this is a case of a 71-year-old female um, who was in, uh, admitted for encephalitis, but was found to be leukopenic. And so uh, she has some confounding factors that give her a microcytic anemia as well, but she was leukopenic, but she had a normal karyotype. She did have some sort of funny looking megas here. Um, she has an erythroid hyperplasia um, and she ends up with a U2AF1 and ASXL1. So I'm an old, uh, an, an old stem cell ASXL1 and I'm a really old stem cell U2AF1 at both at high VAF. And so she has an unexplained cytopenia with her leukopenia. She has some funny looking cells and she has high VAF I'm an old stem cell genes. And so these can be used to support clonality despite her normal karyotype um, in the diagnosis of an MDS multilineage dysplasia. In this case, uh, no excess blast. This is another example in which um, mutations can be used to support a diagnosis of um, MDS. So this was a 59 year old female with um, triple negative breast cancer. She also had ovarian cancer with a BRCA2 mutation, had seen a, just really a crap ton of chemotherapy, this poor woman, and now had new cytopenias. Um, so you can see she's pan-cytopenic, she's neutropenic. Um, her bone marrow biopsy though, had the typical weenie hematopathologist disclaimer that it was not diagnostic of MDS. But if you look here, she has a multiplicity of PPM1D and P53 mutations. And so when you read the clinical notes, the diagnosis is actually of a presumed MDS in this case, even though there wasn't enough dysplasia to call it because of her mutational burden and the classic pattern of a therapy-related myeloid neoplasm with uh, DNA damage repair genes. And so there's sort of two tracks to neoplasia. There is the slow track with just time and aging where you're just slowly accumulating other mutations and eventually end up with a significant mutational burden and subclonal complexity to give you a myeloid neoplasm. Whereas in the case of um, a chemotherapy induced or therapy related myeloid neoplasms, you have repeated assaults on the marrow that rapidly select for DNA damage repair gene mutations. And then that rapidly leads to a therapy related myeloid neoplasm. So despite the fact that the diagnostic criteria um, in most cases do not include mutations, um, you can use mutations to support the diagnosis of MDS. They can also be helpful in prognosing MDS. This is an online calculator used by the Cleveland Clinic that uses 11 different genes to sort of up or down tier prognosis. SF3B1 associated again with ring sitter blast is the only one that up tiers diagnosis, um, prognosis, sorry, everything else down tiers it. Um, you can also use mutations to help you in therapy and monitoring um, perp, um, uh, efforts. And so um, in, in terms of stem cell transplantation, which is the only curative um, modality in MDS, um, P53 mutations are actually associated with very poor overall survival after stem cell transplantation and not surprisingly associated with genomic complex complexity and therapy related um, MDSs. And so those patients, you know, again, they'd still do better than if you don't have any stem cell transplant at all. But I think you have to ask yourself if it might not be worthwhile in those cases to, um, in patients with very high morbidity, maybe uh, um, uh, comorbidities that maybe you wouldn't transplant those patients at all. Um, RAS mutations are fascinating because they're associated with early relapse post stem cell transplantation, but that can be overcome by a myeloablative conditioning. So don't use reduced intensity if, if for RAS mutations, if they can, if the patient can tolerate it, go to myeloablative conditioning. In addition, this study out of WashU shows that if you monitor patients post-transplantation, you know, they may have a panoply of different mutations, the mean VAF of which is shown by the solid bar, but the, um, the range is shown here by the green. Um, if you then monitor them post-transplantation day 30 and day 100, 
those patients that had complete disappearance of their uh, of their variants, and this is the insert here, just allows you to zoom in, whether or not they had RIC, and, RIC conditioning or myeloblative conditioning, those that completely cleared had no progression or relapse of their MDS, whereas those that had persistence of their mutations um, after transplant, even sub 1%, this is why UMIs are so important or error correction is so important, even sub 1% was associated with worse prognosis um, post-transplant. So uh, very important that in this day and age that we get to those monitoring levels of um, um, variant allele fractions by NGS. Back to our, um, back to our female who was, um, uh, with the uh, delta beta thalassemia, who um, was diagnosed with MDS, 13 months later, she was noted to have circulating blasts. Um, so 3% circulating blasts. And you can see, again, she has a very monotonous looking bone marrow now, including some very funny looking megas. This is uh, the variants that she had before, the U2AF1 and the ASXL1. But now 13 months later, those variants are still there, but she has now a whole bunch of additional mutations that are all RAS pathway mutations, KRAS and two different NRAS mutations. And if you look at the variant allele fractions of these, they kind of add up to the U2AF1 um, variant allele fraction, suggesting that these are all subclonal events and that individual subclones sort of converged upon sort of the same sort of general idea, pathway or mechanism of converging onto badness, in this case, AML. And so this is what I refer to as convergent evolution, but also I frequently refer to this as the buy one, get one free of RAS mutations. So unlike in sol the solid tumor realm where like you're gonna have one KRAS mutation that is causing, you know, that is the driver in your pancreatic carcinoma. In this particular case, in heme malignancy, there are subclonal progression events. And so this was diagnosis of AML with myelodysplasia related changes or a secondary AML. So this is the old MDS classification scheme, not the, not the 2022 ones, but um, just for simplicity's sake, you can see that as you have increasing dysplasia and increasing blasts in particular, you have a higher risk of progression to AML. And that is why blast count is taken into, into the international prognostic scoring system, especially the revised one um, shown here, that then parses out your time to evolution to AML. And so you can see that there is a nice, you know, spacing apart of the five different risk groups. However, arguably, if you look at the number of bad boy mutations, um, the more mutations you have, the worse you do. And that arguably there's a lot more granularity in terms of like impending doom with a lot of mutations. So what are these other mutations? You can think of them sort of forwards and backwards. Uh, if we look at this from the forwards perspective, or sorry, from the backwards perspective, we can take all AMLs and determine which ones of those must have come from sort of a secondary origin. Um, and that's the, the Lindsley paper shown here. They found that the presence of a mutation in one of eight different genes was 95% specific for the diagnosis of a secondary AML. And of course, this is associated with very poor prognosis. And perhaps not surprising to you because you've been listening to my talk now for like 50 minutes, uh, you'll see that those genes that um, are associated, part of that eight gene signature include the I'm an old stem cell genes, as well as I'm a really old stem cell splicing genes. The other genes that are found that, you know, if you look at what other mutations are then acquired, um, sorry, the eighth gene is a cohesin. But now if you look at the other gene mutations that are acquired, they tend to be in the transcription pathway and signal transduction pathway, as well as some additional epigenetic changes as well. This was also shown prospectively in the Mosner paper where they basically just serially um, sequenced a bunch of different MDS patients. And you can see here that they have the, I'm an old stem cell and I'm a really old stem cell of ASXL1 and SRSF2 as the founding clone shown here on the fish plot. And then they have now a buy one, get one free of RUNX1. So the buy one, get one free is not only of signal transduction pathway, but also transcription pathways. And those are shown down here on the bottom, the signal transduction pathways and the transcription pathways down below. Uh, signal transduction cannot be either growth factor receptor pathways, which is through the RAS RAF pathway, or the cytokine receptor pathways, which is the JAK-STAT pathway. I will add, um, because I'm not going to directly cover it, is that um, in the transcription pathway, 
many genes that uh, some of which are highlighted in red here are actually associated with um, germline predisposition for the development of AML or MDS. And so those um, children who have germline mutations in these are much more prone to get an additional, they already have essentially one progression event hit. And so then a, a secondary one would then give them a malignancy. Um, and so these are now, some of these mutations um, have now been um, included in the ELN guidelines for AML uh, testing and risk stratification. And so the coleman lindsley 8 gene signature is shown here, as well as some of the other genes, including FLT3, NPM1, CEBP alpha, and P53 are all um, associated with specific risk categorization under the ELN guidelines for AML. And so you can sum up sort of the entire uh, pattern of MDS transforming to uh, an acute myeloid leukemia with this following schema. At the time that a stem cell goes bad, it's carrying any number of passenger mutations. Um, and then it gets the founding driver mutations, which tend to be splicing and epigenetic. Then you have any number of subclonal events that can occur, but the at the time of progression to AML, you get what I like to refer to as the Boston driver mutations, where they have, uh, because Boston drivers have a lot of trouble with signaling and are highly dysregulated because they will flip you off as they cut you off, turning left hand, turning left out of the right hand lane, and you're in the left hand lane trying to turn left, and they cut you off and they flip you off and honk at you. And, um, and so they're highly dysregulated and really don't signal at all. Um, and so those I think of as the Boston driver mutations. You can have, a, as I mentioned, additional epigenetic mutations, P53 mutations, set BP, uh, BP1 mutations as sort of other progression events. But I think the Boston driver just sort of sums it up in, in one fell swoop. Now, when you treat the AML with shock and awe, um, a seven plus three, um, you can actually revert this back to um, just an epigenetic sort of chip state with DNMP3A, TET2, and asx one mutations, or the DTA genes. And those do not carry any um, risk of relapse, whereas these other mutations would carry increased risk of relapse. And then I'm going to end up um, the discussion of MDS um, and most of the talk then with just putting a shout out for pediatric MDS, um, because it turns out that in many cases of pediatric disease, the founding clone, instead of being splicing and epigenetic, is actually a cytogenetic abnormality. Kids just have sort of low risk and high risk um, cases of MDS. The low risk cases have these cytogenetic abnormalities, especially of chromosome seven. Um, and then when they get high risk disease, then that's when they get a lot of um, signal transduction pathway and uh, transcriptional dysregulation gene um, uh, disruption mutations. And so you, what you won't see here are splicing and epigenetic gene mutations because these aren't old stem cells. And so with that, I'm gonna speed over to just um, a final slide, which is um, sort of a summative slide of everything altogether, which is that again, passenger mutations, founding driver mutations, Oh, sorry, this is not the slide I want, uh, this one. Um, passenger mutations, founding driver mutations, and then in the case of many uh, MPNs as well as MDS MPNs, there are what I refer to as the backseat driver mutations, which are mutations that sort of, they're not driving the car, but they're telling it where to go. They're telling it phenotypically what to look like. So you can think of these as like the JAK 2s and CalRs of your MPNs or your kit mutations in systemic mastocytosis or like Sybil mutations in CMML and things like that. And then finally you get the Boston driver mutations. The pediatric equivalents of all of these just don't have the old stem cell gene mutations. And so, um, you know, we'll, we'll have other founding mutations. And then finally, I just wanna end with the fact that there are many manifestations of, of myeloid neoplasms that can occur. Um, and we've done a couple of case, uh, individual cases, and then we're publishing a case series, um, hopefully knock on wood shortly, where we've shown the clonal relatedness of different manifestations of the same darn thing. Um, and so this is a case where we had AMML, AML, and then it in remission sort of uh, exposed and underlying CMML. And then they got leukemia cutis, which actually looked like this mixed histiocytic Langerhans cell thing that turned out um, to be clonally related. 
this was a case of AML that then um, in the skin manifested in both the skin and the bone marrow in spatially segregated ways in the bone marrow um, with a blastic plasma cytoid dendritic cell neoplasm. But Recording all- stopped. Um, and with that, I will just say that um, there, you know, I think I've shown you that their chip, di- chip mutations don't necessarily make it into diagnostic criteria because they don't equate with neoplasia. Pathogenic ver- mutations can be used as a measure of clonality, but the mutational pattern is the most important things, and they can be quite complex um, and uh, show clonal evolution and buy one, get one free. Pediatric m- diseases show the same pattern, but without the old stem cell. And then finally, there um, are a lot of progression mutations, the Boston driver mutations, and clonal evolution is both common and informative. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and for going right up to the hour. Um, uh, I'm happy to stay on for a couple of minutes and take additional questions um, if people have any questions. Thanks, Annette. I really appreciate it. Um, unfortunately, we all have a meeting at nine o'clock that we need to go to. So, no problem. Um, but if there are people that have questions, um, I'm sure we can uh, get you in contact with Dr. Kim and uh, and um, answer those questions. So thank you so much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. And uh, thanks again. Thank you for inviting me. My pleasure to enjoy talking with all of you. Bye-bye.